Hi, and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for Star Trek Discovery Season 1, Episode 7, Magic to Make the Sanest Man Go Mad. This video is a part of a series of videos where I review episodes of Star Trek Discovery. Uh, so I'll have to start with the spoiler warning for Discovery up to Season 1, Episode 7. If you haven't seen up to this episode, you may not want to watch this video. Otherwise, some things may be spoiled for you. So this episode was fun. I, I kind of like this episode. And uh, I think I just think about all the people complaining about Discovery being so you know, dark and dire and so serious and there's never any levity or comedy to it, which actually I don't think is true. I think there's plenty of moments of levity and comedy in the first six episodes, but this episode in particular is a really lighthearted, fun romp. Now, granted, there are serious things about it to people dying and whatnot, uh, but I think it works really well. Um, and I'm actually surprised at how well they used mud, hairy mud, which I wasn't happy at all. You'll hear me talk about in my review of episode four, which I did not like. Uh, I was not happy with them using hairy mud in Discovery, but I actually liked his inclusion in this episode to my surprise. Uh, so it was surprisingly good. Uh, there, I still had some issues with it. Uh, I wouldn't say it was one of the best episodes, uh, but I did enjoy it. So, uh, <laughs> so the episode begins with, uh, Michael Burnham's log. Now, uh, I don't know if this is the biggest time jump, uh, in the show. Certainly the time jump between episode two and three was bigger. Uh, but it does seem like a lot of time has passed. And this log was sort of giving us up to date on it. And she was saying that, uh, one big piece of information I think she gave away in this log is that... Um, the uh, Federation's winning the war against the Klingons, uh, which is news because they were losing before. Uh, now, I've heard some others complain that Discovery isn't showing as much of the war while they were just seeing like little snippets, but I'm actually perfectly okay with that. In fact, they brought up Deep Space Nine, uh, but I'd actually turn that example and throw it against them and say Deep Space Nine often did the exact same things that Discovery is doing because we never saw every single uh, Battle of the Dominion War in Deep Space Nine. They would just show us the highlights. They would give us updates, much like this log, through like Cisco's log where he'd say this is how the war is going. So they're doing the exact same thing, but if there's something important happening in the war, we'd see it happen on Deep Space Nine and the same things true of Discovery. If something is worth seeing, we'll see it. We don't need to see every tiny little battle like the whole entire show. Doesn't need to focus on the war, just like the last two seasons of Deep Space Nine didn't always focus on the Dominion War. They were like, I would say, the majority of episodes actually had nothing to do with the Dominion War, so uh, I'm perfectly fine with this, and I'm fine getting this update. It is interesting, though, that the Federation's winning, because usually, and if you compare it to Deep Space Nine, Deep Space Federation was all always losing the war pretty right up until like towards the end they were always losing in order and they did this writers did this course to create tension say the situation's dire and they've been doing this on discovery until now so it's quite a change that they're saying oh we're winning now usually that's you know a roadblock in terms of writing because it doesn't have uh, set up for, you know, oh, things are so dire, we need to win, we're losing, we need to do something, which is, even shows like Stargate would do this a lot, would be like, oh, we're impossible, we're gonna lose, we're gonna lose, we're gonna lose, and they do this in order to create tension. I actually, if they manage to pull this off, Federation winning, uh, in order to create more writing opportunities, and I'm gonna give the writers a shitload of credit, because I actually think that's kind of a crutch, even though I do like Deep Space Nine, I do like Stargate, I think that's a crutch that they use far too often. Oh, we're gonna lose, we're dying, ah, in order to create tension, so they can create tension and good story. Another way, I'm all for it, so hopefully uh, we will see that going forward. Although I do have a feeling that the Klingons are going to spin things around and that's how they're going to move momentum forward. But hey, if it works for the story, fine. But at least for the time being, I think it worked for this episode in particular because it creates the story beat of Mud uh, selling the Discovery in order to turn things around for the Klingons. So it makes those stakes higher. So saying we're winning the war at the very least works for this one episode. 
Anyway, uh, so Lieutenant Burnham ends her log by saying, oh, she has to go to a party. And she talks about it like it's the worst thing ever. Now, I'm pretty, I haven't seen any of the reviews or reactions yet, but I am just can guess I, off the top of my head. I know a lot of the <laughs> Trekkies' heads are going to explode because of this party, which is a modern day party. And they're listening to 21st century music. Or I can't remember off the top of my head. I'd have to watch the episode again. But there were specific pop songs that are popular. Now, be fair. To be honest, I wasn't a fan of that either. Uh, but I'm sure a lot of Trekkies are heads are going to explode because this is not been established in Star Trek. Typically, when there's a party in Star Trek, especially in like Next Generation original series, it's like all classy and they're listening to classical music. Sometimes jazz. Sometimes you see Riker and Tim Ford and they'd be listening to jazz and stuff, but it would also always be a bit more sort of classy and more sort of civilized. Where here it was, it seemed like a frat party <laughs> really because they're all drunk we never really seen like we see the start people in star trek drinking and sometimes they get a bit tipsy like yeah, there's a few times when scotty got drunk and they made made a, a bit of a a show out of that but we never here it never seemed like a frat party like it does here like they're just drinking like tilly was a bit drunk and there's people making out in the corner and again like Next Gen skirted this. You did see some people making out in 10 Ford, but it was never like this. It was never as obviously modern, let's say, <laughs> as it was here. So it did bother me, to be honest. It did seem like a way for them to sort of appeal to the, try to appeal to the modern audiences. Uh, but it actually worked better than Enterprise's attempts to appeal to modern audiences, which were eye-rollingly bad as they were blatant and obvious attempts oh look at us we're so cool and they look like and your old grandpa trying to be cool whereas here at least it actually does do a good job at uh you know appearing like most modern tv shows wasn't it so it didn't seem forced or contrived the way enterprise did but still i don't know I could have done without it. I think it was a bit silly, but it, it wasn't a deal breaker for me. My head's not going to explode or anything. Uh, so, uh, whatever. Move past it. Uh, okay, so then we get to this storyline with the space whale, which I, I don't know. I haven't looked it up in the wiki, but I'm pretty sure this hasn't been mentioned in Star Trek before. Maybe it has. Maybe I'll be corrected by some trackies. But, I mean, it's... Uh, I think it's a good concept, and I think it goes along with what we know about Star Trek, and uh, it's interesting that this is the thing that sort of Harry Mudd uses to set things in motion. Uh, but I think in the first loop, it was Burnham who said it's uh, Federation regulations that it's endangered species, so we have to try to save its life, otherwise we'll be in violation, which is, okay, fine. I was fine with that, but then I think in another loop, Saru says this, and Saru even goes as far as saying, well, the captain could be court-martialed if he does uh, nothing. Now, we need to save the... Oh, yeah, it was when Burnham, because she was tipped by Stannis, is like, no, let's not save it. And Saru is like, oh, we have to save it, otherwise we'll be in breach of regula regulations. And uh, the captain could be court-martialed. Really, Saru? Do you really want to go there? You want to go there, Mr. Freaking torturing a freaking tardigrade, <laughs> you know, uh, to death, which is also a living creature. And in fact, the officers were telling you it, in fact, could be a sentient creature. But no, you want to kill it. You want to torture it until it died. And you have the nerve to whine about some endangered species. Get the fuck out of here. Get the Sorry, I, as I said, I'm not going to let this go. Never. Saru should be in jail. Anyway, <coughs> let's move on. <laughs> so the, let's talk about the time loop itself. Now, I love this. Um, and I dare say I actually love it better, like the better than cause and effect. And a lot of people, like uh, Next Generation fans and whatnot, cause and effect, of course, is the time loop episode from the next generation it was one of the first time loop episodes and in fact came out before groundhog's day so yeah pretty trailblazing stuff but 
A lot of people put cause and effect on like their top 10 Next Generation episode. Let's say is one of the best episodes ever. I don't. I never had. Well, maybe when it first came out I had. But more recent years I never have. And I just attend that. It's moderately good. It's a good episode, but not great. And the reason why is in that time loop episode, we get a lot of scenes through the loop that we don't need. Now, I said before in another video that it's repetitive, but then someone in the comments is like, well, that's the whole point. It's supposed to be repetitive. No, 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 no. You're, you're missing my point. That's <laughs> You're missing what I'm actually saying. What I'm saying is we're seeing some scenes in this loop that we do not need to see in order to push the story forward, that they're just there to... And therefore, they come off as repetitive because they're not necessary. Not that we're repeating the same uh, thing around, because I know that's the whole point of a time loop story. But the fact that we don't need to see this in order to further the story forward, and that's what I love about this episode, is that you, they skip over the stuff that we don't need to see again. Like, uh, we get a couple of stuff through the loops with Stamus explaining to Burnham that they're in a time loop. And we do need to see that, so that makes sense. But when it gets to the late Later loops uh, when they're formulating a plan we don't need to see this again because we've already seen it several times so they skip it and that's why I think it works better than cause and effect in fact it reminds me a lot of uh, these time loop episodes written by uh, Joe Malozzi uh, who did a great job in fact previously these those were my two favorite uh, time loop episodes the ones that he wrote which were from Stargate SG-1 one called Window of Opportunity, and another one from Dark Matter, which just came out this year. Uh, I can't remember the name of that episode off the top of my head. But uh, both of those, I think the Dark Matter one was probably my favorite. Uh, and the reason why is because they skipped the repetitiveness and they got right to the point. They treated the audience like they were smart. They didn't treat them like idiots, with, which frankly I think cause and effect did. I think in retrospect it probably did that because it was the one of the first time loops so they the audience was kind of ignorant to the time loop thing but i think now it's been done so much groundhog day and pretty much every major sci-fi show has done a time loop episode so now it's become a bit of the norm so people now have the luxury of just treating the audience uh like they're intelligent and they know what's going on so we don't need to spoon feed them every scene over and over and over again and that allows for more storytelling and also the thing about those uh, two episodes window of opportunity and the dark matter one is that they are funny they take the comedic as aspect of being trapped in the loop uh, which is what this episode does. So this episode seems to be taking a cue from those episodes, which is why I think it really works, and I think I even would go as far to say it's better than cause and effect. I wouldn't say it's better than the Dark Matter or the SG-1 ones, because those were actually funnier, I think, and I had some more issues with this one than I did with those ones, but I still think uh, it was good, and I do like how... They did. They got to the meat of the time loop. They only showed you the stuff over again that you needed to see over again. They didn't unnecessarily repeat things that didn't need to be repeated. <laughs> um, but okay, so let me get to some of the stuff that bothered me about the episode, and that was the Burnham and Tyler will they the will they won't they relationship now i kind of like the i like the concept of a burnham being like all socially weird and awkward and because she grew up on vulcan she's not really hasn't really been in a social uh, relationship and i love the secret that she ends up telling to uh stamets in order to get her to believe him in the next loop is that she's never been in love before I, that that was good and i think that fed in nicely to the main storyline with the two of them the problem i had is that the storyline <laughs> seemed shoehorned in and it seemed like they spent time like unnecessarily like the thing with uh you know lieutenant tyler and uh burnham dancing uh it seemed like they, they, they should be doing something about the time loop. They should be doing something to stop Harry Mudd while he's sitting there dancing. And sometimes when they talk about this and talked about their feelings and they're like, oh, Stamets had to tell me because he likes me, and she, you know, the, you know, he knows that uh, I like you and he knows that you like me. Blah 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 blah. And it seemed that seemed a bit 
forced in there. It seemed a bit contrived, to be perfectly honest. I did have, I liked the concept of relationship between the two of them, but I didn't like the way it was executed. And uh, by the way, um, still totally think that Ash Tyler is a Klingon. <laughs> the fact that they're having a romance with Burnham doesn't change my mind about that. I think it's going to make it more tragic once she finds out that he's a Klingon. But anyway, let's talk about Harry Mudd. As I said, I was actually a bit surprised that I liked because I was very bashing his appearance. I still think that Discovery didn't need to have Harry Mudd in you know, didn't need to revive this character who I never really liked. It does feel like a pandering to the original series. And in fact, at the start of this episode when he was killing people, I was like, whoa, what the hell? This is totally violating canon. It doesn't make any sense. If Harry Mudd killed Starfleet officers, he wouldn't be able to joke around with Kirk in uh, the later season. But it's fixed because that's a time loop. So technically those murders never really happen <laughs> because it was a time loop and the way the episode ended uh they kind of swiped things on the under the rug and they're trying to and i love i love the way they did this and of course it tied into uh canon and to harry mudd's character because if you don't remember the character stella was mentioned in the original series in this episode where he was in a world with androids and robots he purposely created an android of his ex-wife Stella, who in that episode was portrayed as much older and much, uh, let's say, less attractive. <laughs> and uh, so he created this android of her who would nag, basically, and be like, Hardcore Fenton Mud, you need to clean your room, blah, 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 and you good for nothing, and just nag and nag and nag. And so Harry would be like, shut up, and she would shut up. So that was the whole purpose of uh, creating uh, <laughs> the android to have of her as his first wife has he explained that uh so he could finally just shut her up and take enjoyment out of it so that's sort of so it actually makes a lot a lot of sense how this episode ended and how basically she was just someone a mark a rich mark that he swindled like he talked about her the previous episode and this episode is so my sweet dear stella but we learned that of course is bullshit she was just a mark because her father was rich he married her so he could rip her off and of course uh they catch up to her and i love how it was part of burns uh schemes was to get her you know basically trap him in this marriage which apparently he'll be trapped in for many years because the android and that uh, series is much older and which is why he holds so much hate and contentment for her uh which by the way uh if you're not familiar with that original series episode kirk's punishment for mud at the end of the episode once uh, he gets a better mud is to force him to live with a whole bunch of different android versions of Stella that he cannot shut up and that will just be constantly be nagging him for the rest of his life <laughs> so in a way this episode ends in a similar way to that one because they uh trap him with the real Stella um so I do I do like the way that tied into everything uh I still think maybe it was a bit too much to have him all gung-ho and wanting to to start a war with the clans and hating Starfleet so much. He's never really been shown to, to go that far of a degree of hatred towards Starfleet or Federation. And you think by what they did to him at the end of this episode, that would actually make his feelings for Starfleet worse, not better. But whatever. It's fine. I'm <laughs> but overall I do like the use of him in this episode, how he was like scheming, conniving, and it was just like the way he reacted. It was like, yeah, I know what's going on, and sick of and sort of treating Lorca like an idiot. And the montage of him killing Lorca in, in horrible ways uh, was was really awesome. Um, so I was because I was actually surprisingly okay with their use of mud. I thought I would hate it, especially from the previews when we saw a scene a clip from this episode where uh, she's like, "You're mad." He's like, "No, I'm mud." I'm like, "Oh, that's so dumb." But actually, seeing it in the context was actually fairly good. I, I, it still wasn't the best. I still they rather not use mud at all and create a new character going well, a different way, but. I'm fine with what they did uh, in the end. Uh, so it was interesting 
than uh, how uh, Burnham got out of it because when they're in that second to last loop, which is always the loop where they try to they figure out how to end the loop, but then they need one more loop in order to actually enact this plan. Uh, so it was interesting that uh, because she had to watch uh, Lieutenant Tyler die horribly, actually, <laughs> the worst death you could possibly have. Uh, so she needed to, and she figured out what Mud was up to and how to stop him, but she needed to create another loop. Now here's the thing, here's another issue I had with the episode. The way that Stamets uh, told, gave up and gave him the information he needed. Why? This makes no sense. He's like, oh, I can't have you killing my friends anymore. But Stamets knows that Mud's just going to start the loop again so his friends won't be dead. And in fact, that was the sort of uh, trump card that Mud had because he knew that um, the people there on the bridge didn't know that they would just be brought back to life in the next loop anyway. So as far as they're concerned, once you kill someone, they're dead for good. But he knew better. But Stannis knew better, so he should have known better and not given up. He should have... I thought Stannis was going to reinforce everyone, tell them not to... Uh, not to kill, uh, not to listen to him because these people would just be brought back to life anyway. So it makes no sense. It seems like it was done 100% for plot purpose in order to create this situation where Mud is, has what he wants, so Burnham has to force a loop. And so it felt very contrived in that regard. I think I think they should have found another way that Mud found out the information he needed, maybe from someone else. Like if someone else had told them, Stamets would be like, no, you idiot, because no one's going to stay dead. Uh, that would have made a lot more sense. It made no sense for Stamets to be the one to tell him. Uh, and then it was cool how Burnham uh, got Mud to start the loop again. Now, I actually thought that she was going to kill Stamets because that would have... That would have been easier, actually, <laughs> because Mud needed Stamets in order to operate the spore drive. He knew this, so all she had to do, kill Stamets, and then that will force Mud to start the loop over again. But instead, she tells him about how important she is and how much money uh, the clans would give him for her, and then kills herself, which was nice. It was a nice touch. But, for one thing, it clues Mud into the fact that she knows that uh, there's a loop. I guess if she killed Stamets, it would clue him in as well. But still, that's banking a lot. I mean, Mud could have easily went, well, it would be nice to have money for her, but whatever. I'll get enough money for the sport drive, so that's good enough for me. And he could have just went ahead and not done another loop. That was risky. Whereas if she killed Stamets, he most definitely would have done another loop. So it was actually, <laughs> that would have been the smarter thing to do. My rating for magic to make the sanest man go mad out of 10 is a 7. Very good. Uh, it was a fun episode. I enjoyed it more than I thought it would. I liked the use of the time loop. I think it was like very concise. It got to the point. It had some funny moments. But it also had some very contrived moments as well. Uh, especially like trying to shoehorn in this Taylor, uh, Tyler and uh, Burnham uh, relationship. Uh, a little bit fake. And the whole thing about, uh, you know, the way that Mud operated this plan and killing people and whatever and then Burnham uh, killing herself when she should have actually killed Stamets. So there's some issues but overall enjoyable episode. I did like it a lot. I did. I think it was a fun episode. So there you go. So that's it for my review of uh, Star Trek Discovery Season 1 Episode 7. Be sure to check out uh, my channel as I continue to review episodes of Star Trek Discovery. I'll also cover uh, many other shows uh, like Game of Thrones, Star Trek, Mr. Robot, and The Expanse, and more. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. Thanks a lot for watching.